Okay, I'm coming back. I'm going to the couch. Right in couch. Oh, weirdness. Can you all hear me? Yeah, uh, this is this is the couch on the other side of my office. Um, I just I I don't know how the audio is because the mic's kind of on the other side of the room right now, so I might have to make some adjustments. Sorry, I should have I should have tested this out a lot more. <laughs> but I'm just like, oh no, I'll, I'll do it live. It's fine. It's fine. It all work. The lighting looks good. It's all good. Yeah, this will show me. Uh, speaking of which. Uh, I have my tablet here uh, so I can see the chat and all that from over here because I don't really have a computer monitor. So I wanted to talk a little bit about my influences and uh, I took a bunch of stuff off my bookshelf um, to show you guys. Uh, so yeah, um, waiting just to see if the audio is good. We good? We good chat? How are we doing? Yeah, we're good? Okay. As long as, long as you can hear me. talk about a few of my influences, people who inspire me, um, just to give some examples and expand on some context for some of the things I've said so far. Uh, 
So in, uh, I'm going to do them in alphabetical order by first name, uh, just because that's the way I organize them. So, yeah, it's not particularly in a, um, uh, a reference order. So, yeah, um, I'm going to start with this guy. Oh, actually, I wanted to talk a little bit about this first. Uh, so this is Flight. Uh, it's the first of eight volumes? Nine volumes? Eight volumes. I think it's eight. Anyway, uh, it's actually a, um, an anthology comic book uh, with each story revolving around the idea of flight. Um, it's got uh, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen. 21 different uh, artists in it. Um, yeah, and it's fantastic. It, it just, it all revolves around the idea of flight. Like, look at this. Look at that. It's so cool. Um, and things like this are really, really awesome when it comes to talking about inspiration. Uh, partly because an anthology is a really interesting way to present um, is a really interesting way for you to come up with a, a prompt, an idea, something, a setting. Um, so like these all revolve around flight and different ideas about flight. And not all of them are about actually flying in like an airplane or having wings or certain things. Like there's a lot of different ways in which they explore the idea of flight. Um, and anthologies like this are really, really cool when it comes when it comes to being a creative person, because like you don't have to think up flight. You just got to think about what would you say about flight, right? Like, what would I say about flight? Um, you know. That feeling, that feeling of, of freedom, the idea of working on an aircraft. I was in the Air Cadets growing up. I've flown on a ton of different types of planes, both two-seaters all the way up to jumbo jets. Like, I, I've, I've been on tons of different types of planes. Um, even some I've, I've worked on planes, like, at, like building them. More than one, in fact. Um... So there's all kinds of really cool aspects that I can think of from my own personal experience as to, as to what flight really means. Um, and that's why anthologies are really cool. And if you have a bunch of artist friends or a bunch of writer friends, and you can get together and do an anthology all about a similar topic, that can lead to some awesome, awesome creativity and awesome ideas. And it's totally worthwhile. Totally. Uh, totally worthwhile. Um, so yeah, Flight, I quite recommend it, there's like eight volumes, um, I just wanted to talk about inspiration and, and, and all that stuff. As I, as I keep reiterating that I wanted to talk about that. So, number one, uh, the first person on my list is Alan Moore. Um, so I guess, yeah, a, a brief overview. Uh, of my five influences, three of them are comic book writers, two of them are also comic book artists, uh, there's one novelist, and one, uh, screenwriter, uh, in the list. So, uh, yeah, there's a bit of a diversity there. I tried to not just pick, like, oh, my five favorite comic book writers, or, like, my five favorite novelists, or like something like that. I wanted to, to have a little bit of diversification. So number one is Alan Moore, a uh, very, very famous comic book writer. Um, I describe him as a Yeti wizard, because that's basically what he looks like, and he's totally a wizard. Uh, like, I didn't say that, like, he said that. Anyway. Uh, he's British, he's like six foot five or something. Sorry, grab the water. He's like six foot five, and uh, yeah, has the craziest beard and hair, like way, way, like down to here, like crazy hair. 
just just lumbers everywhere. Um, and, and he's written some of the best regarded comic books in history. Well, I guess graphic novels is, is the better term for it. Uh, so he wrote Watchmen. He wrote uh, V for Vendetta. Uh, From Hell. Uh, the movie with Johnny Depp was actually based on one of his graphic novels. Uh, which is actually what this is from. This is the companion book to From Hell. From Hell. Um, I don't actually own a copy of From Hell, surprisingly. Uh, but the companion book I did buy because it's really, really cool. And I'm going to dive into that a little bit uh, in a second. Uh, he also wrote uh, The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, uh, The Killing Joke, The Batman Story. Uh, super, super cool. Um, I, yeah, just, just like that's what inspired um, Heath Ledger's Joker in The Dark Knight, right? Um, and they even used some of the art on it for the tattoos on, on Jared Leto's uh, version of the Joker. Yeah, so yeah, that Alan Moore, uh, he wrote for 2000 AD, which I really liked. I really liked his 2000 AD stuff, The Ballad of Halo Jones, D.R. and Quinch, um, Promethea, Top Ten, um, all this really cool stuff and a variety of genres variety of styles, all very gritty um, explorations of certain types of things. Um, one of the reasons I really like him uh, is because of his panel construction uh, and the way that he uses panels to pace his story. Uh, he's one of the few uh, people I've seen who use a nine grid layout, like a three by three. Uh, E all equal squares uh, sort of layouts and it's super interesting when you kind of break that down into very very short story segments um, and uh, he's also one of like the way that he uh, describes to his right uh, to his artists his panel layout uh, is it's super symmetrical like he does symmetrical panel layouts he doesn't have asymmetrical anything it's all very square and it's really neat because it's so different for being square um, I kind of love it And the stories he writes and the way that he explores characters are is super intense uh, all of the time. Um, but if you ever get to read an Alan Moore script, like one he wrote for one of his comics, and do it, because it gets a little crazy in all of the best ways. Um, so I, I like that's why I have the companion because it actually has uh, parts of the script in it. So I'm going to pull up, uh, where is it? Um, where are we now? Here, all right, all right. So here's page one, panel one from From Hell by Alan Moore, uh, drawn by Eddie Campbell, who's also very awesome. Um, so, okay, let's get out there and win one for the Ripper. Actually, that Robert's block joke, but I thought I'd stick it in anyway. This first page has nine evenly spaced panels, all taken from a fixed point of view. Year is 1923, and we're in Bournemouth, down on the beach quite close to the tide line. The month is September. A laden outcast day with a blind white sky and gray tides sulkily coming into damp sand of a pale gray beach. The time is late afternoon or early evening, and if we could see the sun, it would be going down. As it is, the sun sinks unseen and without spectacle behind the smothering, featureless duvet of cloud. Its only visible effect is that throughout the enti this entire eight-page episode, the light gradually worsens through dusk to the beginnings of darkness. We are looking down from the beach, looking along the edge of the tide from a ground-level viewpoint. To the right of the picture, stretching away towards the distance, we see the great w black waves watching sluggishly, in with their skirts of grubby white foam. To the left, we have a smoky impression of the granite seawall and the buildings of the Bournemouth seafront rising up stolidly behind it. And then it goes on. And on. The first panel is almost 2,000 words. <laughs> and it's written in all caps all of the time. Alan Moore only writes in caps. I've never seen a script where he didn't write in caps. 
Um, and that first panel is a third of the page. <laughs> and it's, it all is astounds me to read his scripts. Like, they're ridiculous craziness. But he's, he is a brilliant writer. And, I mean, uh, I talked about a lot of the ones that he's written that have had movie adaptations. Like, that's a solid, you know, six, seven movies based on his work alone. Uh, and not even some of his best work, per se. Uh, but just stuff that people have adapted. So that's Alan Moore. Uh, the next person I want to do is Brent Weeks. Brent Weeks. The Way of the Shadows, the Night Angel trilogy. Uh, which is what I have here. I also have the graphic novel, though it's still on the shelf. Uh, there's a graphic novel adaptation of The Way of the Shadows. Uh, which I also really liked for completely different reasons. Um, and it was super fascinating to read. Uh, but I'll get back to that. Uh, so, Brent Weeks is an American fantasy writer. Uh, he's written about seven books uh, since he first published The Way of Shadows in 2008. I read them in 2010, all three of them. Uh, I haven't read the second series he started writing, which is the Lightbringer series. I do have a couple of them, but I haven't read them yet. I really want to, and I should get around to it. Uh, and Brent Weeks' website is actually the person who introduced me to graphic audio which is the coolest uh, audiobook group I've ever seen, where they, they have full narration with character voice actors and sound effects and music, and like it's, it's a full uh, setup, like radio drama for doing audiobooks, and it's, it's just unbelievable. And the version of uh, the Night Angel trilogy that they do is, is one of their best things that I've ever seen from them. Uh, it, it just... It adds so much more grit and interesting things and, and tension to all of all of the, the, the written passages. Um, and the reason I really like Brent Weeks is because his worlds like are full of life. Like they don't feel like traditional fantasy worlds. They feel like they breathe, like they have an actual society that's based on a certain set of codes that, or or practices. And uh, it's filled with um, good people who do bad things and bad people who do good things and uh, crazy magic killers who are plagued by decisions and uh, are betrayed by their magic and like all kinds of ridiculous, uh, amazingly well done fantasy things that oh, just always, always... Uh, inspire me. So I'll read a passage from that, uh, just because I read the Alan Moore thing and now I kind of feel like I have to. So I'll read the first paragraph here. Uh, Azoth squatted in the alley, cold mud squishing through his bare toes. He stared at the narrow space beneath the wall, trying to get his nerve up. The sun wouldn't come up for hours and the tavern was empty. Most taverns in the city had dirt floors, but this part of the Warrens had been built over marshland, and not even drunks wanted to drink standing ankle-deep in mud. So the tavern had been raised a few inches on stilts and floored with stout bamboo poles. Coins sometimes dropped through the gaps in the bamboo, and the crawl space was too small for most people to go after them. The guild's bigs were too big, and the littles were too scared to squeeze into the suffocating darkness, shared with spiders and cockroaches and rats and the wicked half-wild tomcat the owner kept. So, Night Angel Trilogy, fantastic. Love it to death. I've read this like three, four times now. Uh, I've read the graphic novel, I've, read the, I've listened to the audiobooks. All good. All good all the time. Um, next is uh, Jeff Lemire. I think it's Lemire. I've never heard anyone pronounce it, unfortunately. Uh, this is a copy of The Underwater Welder. Uh, one of his uh, original graphic novels. Really, really like this. Um, yeah, uh, so Jeff Lemire's Canadian. He's actually from just outside Toronto. Uh, he still lives uh, in the Toronto area, the GTA. Uh, he's got a really cool style. Uh, I don't know if you could really tell from the, the cover page, but like his characters are very, very interesting in the way that he, uh, he, he draws them. Because uh, he also illustrates. Not everything he does. He's primarily a writer, but he also illustrates some of his own work, uh, mostly. 
Um, so his notable stuff are uh, are the independent comic book Sweet Tooth. Uh, he did a six issue miniseries called Trillium, which was really really cool. Uh, the Underwater Welder, uh, the Essex County Trilogy, which was kind of the first thing he ever did, which which put him on the map. And he's actually really famous right now for his run on Animal Man uh, when the DC universe rebooted itself in the New Fifty Two. Um, so uh, yeah. Uh, his run on Animal Man was super well achieved, and it was really, really cool, because it explores superheroes in this very interesting way, uh, especially because there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of, uh, like, magic and mystery and, and mythology and all kinds of stuff mixed into it that I thought really, really complemented the, uh, really complemented the super superhero aspects. Um, so the things that I like about Jeff Lemire are, um, I love his unique art style. It doesn't look very good all of the time, but it's really easy to tell his characters apart uh, despite how stylized it is. And he communicates his story very, very well. He knows how to construct good panels and interesting covers and use his art style effectively to his advantage. Um, and uh, his, his works are really experimental, they're, they're kind of weird, uh, they're filled with like unrecognizable monsters, and, and nothing is quite what it seems, and I, I just, I really am inspired by him, and he's a fellow Canadian, and I love that. Uh, so yeah, I'd like to do, I'd like to do some of the stuff that he does. Um, so yeah, there's Jeff Lemire. I don't have anything to read from him. Because he doesn't really have any prose, unfortunately. And comics don't really read well on screen. <laughs> uh, unless they're actually up. Uh, so we're going to jump to Yoshihiro Tatsumi. Um, who's probably my favorite manga artist of all time. Uh, like, easily my favorite manga artist of all time. Um, he's the godfather of uh, a Japanese uh, manga form called uh, Kikika. Um... Which is technically not manga, but kind of is, because it's it's sort of the, uh, it was an alternative form of Japanese comics that was trying to compete with manga in the fact that it was trying to be for adults and not for kids and, and not whimsical, which is kind of what manga really means. Uh, so yeah, um, he brought this really cool cinematic flair, cinematic pacing to his work. Um, he was inspired by Osama Tetsuka, but later went on to inspire, uh, Osama Tetsuka with his later works. Um, and I love Osama Tetsuka, don't get me wrong, but he's, he's such a big name that I kind of wanted to talk about some of the littler people to start with, um, especially in terms of manga. And A Drifting Life, which is, is what I have here, by, uh, Yoshishiro Tatsumi. I actually have all of Yoshishiro Tatsumi's books uh, that were translated in English, except for one, but I have the redone version of it. I don't have the older version. Um, but yeah, Yoshihiro Tatsumi. Uh, this is, uh, his, is a semi-autobiographical uh, version of his life. Um, it won a bunch of Eisner's. Uh, it's actually published by a Canadian uh, comics publisher, Drawn and Corley, based out of uh, Montreal. Uh, who published a lot of really cool indie comics uh, and are probably the coolest comic sculpture in Canada. Probably. Um, but yeah, uh, so uh, Tatsumi wrote uh, this. He wrote uh, Black Blizzard, a book called Falling Words, which was an exploration of Japanese um, spoken uh, storytelling traditions. Uh, Band in the Old in Tokyo, one of his uh, short story collections, like one of his short comic collections. Uh, the Pushman Out of Story is another short uh, comic collections uh, book. Uh, but yeah, reading in Drifting Life when I was in college, like, it was the first time that I, I had, like, I felt like someone understood me as a writer. And, uh, that really, like, got, like, really helped form the way that I approach my writing now. 
uh, where he talks about how he changed his style from that mango style into, into the way that he wanted to tell stories. And, and that helped me um, learn and adapt my own style. So I could tell my own types of stories, my own experiments and, and all that stuff. And um, he's very, very humanistic. Uh, no topic is too risque. Uh, stuff that he covers in his books are like uh, incest, bestiality, uh, rape, war, uh, disease, uh, depression, uh, alcoholism, uh, like... Working class versus upper class, uh, like he, he covers everything, everything, um, and yeah, just explorations of the human psyche, what it means to be an animal, like, yeah, just I I know I have like this blank book on my face where I'm just I'm just reminded of all of the different storytelling aspects that I love about these, these people that I'm talking about. Um, I forgot to go get it because I have a DVD copy of it downstairs, but the fifth person on my list is, um, Zach Helm. And I realize that not many people are going to recognize the name Zach Helm, uh, compared to some of the other names on this that I've talked about. Uh, but Zach Helm is an American writer and film director. Uh, his, his two, like, major Hollywood movies that he wrote. Uh, so he's written two plays and two films. Or, sorry, two plays and four films. But two of the films were made for TV, and then two of them were actually theatrical pictures. And the two theatrical pictures are actually probably what you've heard of, but you wouldn't have necessarily associated them with Zach Helm. Uh, so Zach Helm wrote uh, Stranger Than Fiction and uh, Mr. Memoriam's Wonder Emporium which are two very drastically different movies, <laughs> but do explore very similar themes. Um, I don't know a ton about Zach Helm, mostly because there's not a ton about him on the internet. He's, uh, he's pretty private. He's not necessarily an A-list guy like someone like Goyer or like those other big name cinema writers, Joss Whedon, uh, who I really like, and a, and a few others. Um, but yeah, uh, Zach Helm loves the comically bizarre. Um, he loves talking about humanity. He likes talking about learning about your humanity. Um, uh, his characters uh, love, live, learn. They're each their own special snowflake. They have their own tics that make them unique, that make them uh, kind of jump off the screen. Um, you know, uh, we had to read a copy of his script for Stranger in Fiction in class, and uh, it was super cool because it 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 kind of broke the mold entirely and had all these music annotations for things he wanted in the soundtrack, like throughout the script. And that's not done in, in a traditional Hollywood script, um, and I don't think they got all of them, but they did get some of them. They did get some of those tracks. They licensed them and used them in the film, and that's why you kind of have that like interesting like sort of punk rock alt rock going going along behind it uh behind stranger than fiction and i just love the way that he does premises like stranger than fiction is such a cool premise uh about a, a guy who realizes he's a character in a novel and try and find the author who's writing him uh because he's a real person uh and he doesn't want the plot of the novel to, to kind of fall out around him uh, Mr. McGordon's Wonder Emporium, a uh, magical toy shop with a magical toy owner uh, who teaches the people who work and are around his shop. Um, and just so whimsical and, and, and fantastic modern fantasy uh, aspects to them. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I really like that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, those are those are like the things I like. Um, I, I read a lot of graphic novels. I read a lot of uh, manga. Uh, I read a lot of fantasy novels, science fiction novels. I need to read more short stories. I've been wanting to for a long time, especially because I've been writing more short stories and I, and I kind of need to. Uh, but yeah, I need to read more short stories. Um, 
a whole smack of of books I need to read. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Like I said, you can't get to all the classics, right? You gotta, you just gotta do what you can to read things that are gonna inform you. So there's all that. Uh -huh. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump back into the computer. Maybe see if I can pull up a couple of things. Because um, I have a little bit of extra time that I didn't think I would have. Uh, so, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm going to pull up a couple more things just to talk about. So I did pretty much all of that without without actually looking at the video preview screen. So I hope I was like positioned correctly in the camera, because otherwise that would that would suck. <laughs> I really hope so. Um. So yeah. Um. Maybe talk a little bit about more. Um. I didn't, I, I told myself I wasn't going to, but I'm going to anyway, just because I have the extra time and I really want to. Um, so I'm gonna pull out some stuff here. Uh, move this. And I got to change this, unfortunately, because it looks so much better. Okay, there we go. So, um, like I said earlier, uh, when I was talking about uh, Yoshihiro Tatsumi, um, I'm a huge Osama Tezuka fan. And Osama Tezuka uh, is the godfather of manga. Uh, he's the guy who put manga on the map. Um, uh, he's known for, um, like his most famous character is Astro Boy. Uh, so if you've seen any of that stuff, especially the old school animation and all that, uh, that's all really cool. Um, he's done, uh, he did like a biopic of Buddha, uh, like a biographic novel of Buddha in a bunch of parts. Um, he, he, he did uh, Kimba the Lion, he did, uh, well, he did these, which, uh, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit. So, <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I also talk really loud, uh, which probably doesn't help, but probably also makes it clearer to hear me, I hope. Uh, yeah. I don't think it's as bad as Derek's echo, though, because I think my room is a little bit smaller. But, you know, it is what it is. Uh, so, yeah. Um, so, this year is MW, and this year is the Ode to Kirohito. These are two of Osama Tetsuka's much later works, uh, which are a lot less childlike. Uh, they're actually two of the most cited works when you talk about Osama Tetsuka writing in a more uh, Gekika style. Um, uh, so yeah, there, there's totally that. Um, and Sam just sent me a picture, which I got. Let's, let's pull that up there. Boom. Astro Boy. The iconic Astro Boy. So, um, yeah, Osama Tetsuka. Huge fan of Osama Tetsuka. Uh, these two are, are fascinating explorations of uh, what it means to be a monster. Uh, which is a topic uh, that I, I am super fascinated by. Um, I think it's one of the strengths of Frozen. Uh, I love uh, Godzilla, the remake of Godzilla for this, this exact sort of thing. Um, the remake of Godzilla was uh, directed by uh, Gareth Edwards, if I'm not mistaken. Let me just double check that real quick. Uh, Godzilla. Yes, it was directed by Gareth Edwards. 
So Gareth Edwards wrote this really cool movie uh, called Monsters, which I loved, which did a lot of similar things and why he got the Godzilla gig. Uh, but yeah, I, I love Monsters. It's it super cool. Um, what else? What else am I thinking about? So yeah, uh, Osama Tezuka uh, basically defined manga style for, for, for very many years. Um, and he's also one of the people who, um, he founded a lot of the animation studios in Tokyo, uh, as well as a lot of the publishers, like, he was a direct influence on how they got started. Uh, so he, he kind of, um, in many ways, basically built the industry on his own back, uh, and, and his story is very fascinating because he was actually a doctor, he was a trained doctor, and he decided to to not do that and do art. Um, yeah, and uh, I might talk a little bit about Hayao Miyazaki, because I love him too. Uh, but yeah, um, well actually, um, as, as sort of part of that, um, Hayao Miyazaki's style is very much influenced by Osama Tetsuka. Uh, they have very, like, the way that uh, Miyazaki draws characters, uh, you can definitely draw correlations between that. Uh, so, oh yeah, the, so the last interesting thing I wanted to say about Osamu Tatsuka is that um, he uh, did this really cool thing where basically, uh, because his style was so simplistic, he had basically what, what, what we would call a cast of characters. So he drew uh, a fat character, and he drew like a skinny character, and he drew like a boy character. And those characters played the same roles in many of his different works. So in a lot of ways, he was casting those, those characters with those, those visual stereotypes and stuff as actors in, throughout his work. Um... And that's a really neat approach to the way that, that uh, artists draw things. Because he understood the limitations of his style in a lot of ways, and, and he used it to his advantage. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'm a huge fan of Osama Tetsuka. I own, like, 12 of his graphic novels, uh, something like that. I've read more. Um, can't recommend him enough. <laughs> There's a reason he's the Godfather. There's a reason, and it's well deserved. Um, I was watching something the other day. What? Oh, I was reading about uh, Journey to the West because uh, we were talking about it a little bit at work, me and Sam, as well as uh, Derek was talking about it that week as well. Uh, so we're talking about Osama Tezuka. Uh, sorry, not Osama Tezuka. We're talking about uh, Journey to the West. And Journey to the West was, uh, there's a version of Journey to the West that Osama, Asuka, uh, Osama Tetsuka did the character designs for. It's called uh, Alakazam the Great in English. Uh, and uh, I actually own it on VHS, and I didn't know he w had worked on it. Though, thinking about it now, I, I realize I can, I can draw the connection between the character design. Uh, but that movie is actually credited with being the thing that got Osama Tetsuka into animation in the first place. Like, the reason he wanted to do an Astro Boy cartoon and all that stuff. Uh, which is super cool. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was actually a really cool version of Journey to the West. Uh, I really like it. Uh, yeah, it's called Alakazam the Great. Um, yes, um, I do know the, the Kingdom of Dreams and Madness. It's on Netflix, is it not? It just got put up on Netflix. I have saved it to my list. I'm going to watch it. Uh, because I do really like Studio Ghibli. Um, I do really like Studio Ghibli. Oh, why didn't I think of it? I talked about Zach Helm. Um, so, yeah. This will be the last influence I talk about, and then I'm going to take another break. But... Well, I'm not surprised it's a weird movie because how Miyazaki is not is not a <laughs> is not a normal person uh, by any stretch. <laughs> so you know, and his art style reflects that in the way that he constructs his movies. Um, his team is very fascinating uh, because they actually um, 
they worked on a couple of movies um, before they became Ghibli. So actually, uh, Nausicaa and the Valley of the Wind is not actually a Ghibli film, uh, though it's considered a Ghibli film because basically all of the main people who worked on it uh, left that company a couple years later and became Ghibli. Uh, but yeah, Nausicaa is not actually a Ghibli, a Ghibli film. Uh, so yeah, you can kind of see that transition, and, and Nausicaa is pretty different from some of the other ones uh, in terms of its pacing and, and uh, the way that it explores themes. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, so um, the last person I'm going to talk about is, uh, is Akira Kurosawa, uh, the legendary Japanese director, uh, which I'm not sure if anyone will actually know when I talk about him. <laughs> uh, but Akira Kurosawa uh, directed um, a bunch of movies. Uh, his three big ones that I know, like big ones that I like off the top of my head, uh, Seven Samurai, which inspired an anime and like a bunch of other stuff. Uh, the movie Ran and the movie uh, Rashomon, uh, all of which are very big staples in film studies classes. Uh, for a lot of different reasons, uh, but Akira Kurosawa is a fantastic director. Uh, my personal favorite movie by him, because uh, I, I have seen Ran, I have seen Rashomon, and all that stuff. I haven't seen Akira, which I want to see, which is kind of his weird uh, exploration of like black and white weirdness. Uh, but the movie I really like by him is Throne of Blood, which is actually a uh, a Shogun era Japanese adaptation of uh, Shakespeare's Macbeth done entirely in black and white uh it's it's very very cool the way that he does cinematography uh and uh yeah he's he's inspired generations of filmmakers uh including myself though i wouldn't necessarily consider myself a filmmaker uh but yeah kira kurosawa uh one of my favorite directors throne of blood Fantastic. Uh, it's one of those things where you can kind of see how Shakespeare's stories can really be pulled out of the time period that they were written in and still function very, very well. Uh, but yeah, cool. All right, I'm going to take a uh, another five-minute break. And I'm going to come back and I'm going to talk about the exercises I did today, um, showcase those a little bit, and I'm going to talk about the book club, and then we're going to do some Q&As and revision and stuff. So yeah, I'm going to take another break here. Cool.